stuff I say about my career that I've been in conflict resolution for more than 25 years and I've been in conflict all my life. <laughs> that qualifies me to talk about conflict. <laughs> Uh, my name is Aldo Civico. As you may guess from my accent, Irish accent, I'm Italian. <laughs> and uh, I've been in conflict resolution for 25 years. I started dealing with problems around the mafia. And, uh, and then I decided to upgrade it. And I've been dealing with the Colombia mafia now for the past 15 years. I do negotiation with uh, drug dealers, death squads, and guerrillas. I have a lighter take on conflict, and I do mostly conflict resolution in an organizational context. And I know most people don't have conflict in the workplace, but I manage to find those that do, and I go in, and uh, it can be pretty nasty in organizations. And now we're doing some work in Colombia, which I differentiate from Columbia University, uh, working with a lot of really wonderful youth in community youth groups, and really trying to change their lives in a post, which I use in quotes, post-conflict situation. And what do you think of the... Uh, yeah, so some initial impressions, and then we'll yeah. bring out a couple of points there. So there was very interesting. One of the things I look at in conflict resolution is critical moments or turning points. So what happens when things are moving along at a certain pace, and then something happens, and it changes? And I think what happened here was they were first bantering back and forth, doing that winners and losers, about very light, cerebral kind of topics. But then it started to get personal. And there were certain turning points, when, and then you saw they weren't going there. And then it got a little you know, nitpicky about things. And you can see that it was starting to escalate. And they did other things to try to have power over. Where somebody left, or they came back, they tried to broach a topic, they changed it. Yeah, I, I saw this arc, right, where we went from an initial game, which was an expression of friendship, and at the end we were left just with hatred, right? And, and I was uh, wondering how there are two things that stay in the way of friendship, of a good relationship or a healthy relationship, which is exactly hatred and, and falsehood. And so in these dynamics between the two characters, I, I saw also a metaphor, not only of how many times we are really very light on, on, uh, on friendship and we don't go into depth and we don't put the effort to build authentic relationships, but also more on a broader level of society, how um, our, our falsehood in the sense that we remain in our boxes, in our stereotypes, right, uh, generate a lot of hatred, right, and, and, uh, and how that goes in uh, how that slips away from that intelligence that I think is needed in order to build dialogue and, and authentic uh, relationships. So when you say Lida, yes, I think about the superficiality of the relationship. And in order to have resilience, yeah. you have to have the depth of understanding, the depth of relationship, so you can sort of ride the waves and ride the storm, because you have that good time yeah. experience together, which they didn't have as much here in the way their dialogue was going. So what would you say are, uh, to stay with the team of a, of a play, winners and losers, what, what are winners and losers in connecting, in building relationship and things that you should do in negotiation and not? So it's definitely a loser to stay in it when it's heated, and it's definitely more of a winner to take a step back and be able to have that space and calm down emotionally and reflect, what do I really want to happen here? Instead of being in the moment and get caught up in the heat of the moment? Uh, okay. Maybe I can share with you when, when I lost and when I won in a, in a negotiator from that point of view. Uh, I was in, Gol in Colombia and I, was, and I wanted to uh, sit down with a, a guerrilla leader. Uh, and uh, I make this story, it's a very fun and long story, but they make it very short. But finally I ended up in, in this high security prison and uh, I sat down with him. And, my losing part was that I was very nervous, and, and my, my being nervous was that I wanted to give him the signal that um, I don't share uh, the fact that he took up weapons and, and kidnapped people, and, and he was a ma major strategist of, of this guerrilla group. Um, and so at one point he was telling me his story, at one point I told him, you think, well, you know, I said, um, 
what I'm hearing, it might also, in theory, sound right and nice, but the fact that you actually defended those values with weapons uh, voids completely your discourse, right? And he looked at me and said, uh, well, because that you don't understand anything about Latin history America, right? Of the history of Latin America. And, and we left it cold, right? So it was a loser, actually, that instead of me creating a space where he could play himself out, right, and, and I tried to connect, I was more preoccupied by defending my identity and, and, and my beliefs and values and ethics and whatever you want, right? I, I was on a higher moral, I, I put myself on a higher moral standard. And, um, and then I wrote him back and he never wrote me responded, so I thought, okay, you know, lost of opportunity. Until one point I told him that I was going back to, uh, to Colombia and that I would have loved to go back to him. And, and he finally responded and invited me back to his cell, which was not really a cell, it was an apartment with a kitchen and an office and uh, cell phones and uh, it was an interesting kind of prison. Um, <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, when we sit down this time, he said, well, you know, I called you back because I wanted your help. And again, I was in that mood and said, oh, this is now, you know, 9-11 had already happened, it is now material support to terrorism, if, if he asked me anything and I, I'm forced somehow to do it for safety, whatever. And he said, you know, I bought some pasta and I bought some uh, meat and I want you to cook me a pasta bolognese. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, I think I can do that. Uh, I can, uh, maybe that's, uh, uh, and so we cooked together. Right, mm -hmm. and and by cooking together, uh, we we connected as human beings. He was not anymore uh, the guerrilla leader who wanted to teach me uh, the history of Colombia and the Colombian conflict, and I was not anymore the academic who had studied PhD and was trying to save the world. Right, we I, I was just an Italian who knows how to cook pasta bolognese, and a good <laughs> one actually. Um, and and uh, and out of that connection, then I was able to be called in into facilitating ceasefire talks and, and, and all of that, right? For me, the big lesson is that you win when you forget about your ego, if you want. We, we saw a lot of ego displayed, if you want, in this uh, play. You know, it was more, it was really about every, my truth and my identity, right? And it was never about really the other, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and that's a loser in negotiation, I think. Yeah. And, and it's a winner when you, when you can connect. So you turned the dynamics out of a superficial relationship into a deep relationship because you connected on that level of humanness. Mm -hmm. You're both human. I think another thing, and then related to that, and related to what we saw in the play here, was the whole idea about emotions. What do you do with emotions? And when somebody is getting escalated yeah. in their emotions, then it's something we might call emotional contagion. And it's so easy. It's like a net that comes over and you get trapped into that. And it's so easy because you want to one-up them and one-up them and one-up them. And then if you do take the higher moral ground, it's still that emotional contagion that gets you in. And that's a loser when you get caught in that net, in that trap. And a winner would be when you're able to recognize and say, whoa, wait a minute. And the expressions like going to the bathroom and stepping outside, getting that meta perspective on things, looking down saying, what are you doing in that situation? Is that what you really want it to be do what you want to be doing? And then you take a step back. That's the winner to and turn. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, while you were talking, I have a, a small technique that gets me free when I get caught up in emotions, right? Um, because we get become hostages, right? And that then you start reacting and your pride and and so I, I developed this this technique that someone taught me. Uh, and it's it's um, it's funny, but it works. So I just give it to you because maybe it works. So when you are in, I have this uh, colleague um, with whom it's very difficult to deal with, right? And, uh, and at one point, um, it was so difficult, it was years, years, years ago, it was so difficult that, that I could not even see me, right? Or he would not greet me, right? And every time we would be in the same room, I would have these emotions going up, right? So I use this technique, right? I, I turn off somehow my screen in my mind, and I start playing around with the figure of this person I'm, I'm upset with or have very strong emotions, negative emotions, and I start making it in a funny cartoon, right? I make him, I turn him into a clown or 
I put in, in, in boxers with a huge belly, and so I start laughing within myself and smiling at this situation, right? And that puts me completely in a different state of mind and frees me from that uh, rage that, that I might be caught, right? And that, and that helps me to, to be cool and continue eating my past. Laugh out loud. You know, I, I, that's all <laughs> happened inside. <laughs> Outside, you didn't even, even realize that I'm out. Because <laughs> that would be quite a but, scene. <laughs> yeah. But so I, I have this, this screen with a part, with a bring with me and, and I play those images yeah. and I create the state of mind that I need in that situation. That's yeah, good. One technique I usually ask myself is what's really going on here? And what's really important to me in this situation? Because then I say, you know, this person is human and he or she is doing the best they can do with what they have at this time and so am I and let's connect on that human level. Because if I start to think about the other things that are happening, like the words that get in the way, then I also might lose it in that way too. Yeah. But it's a winner when I can stay in control and just connect on that level of humanity and say, what's really important here? What it's about? And I think the other thing is, and, and I was thinking also because of what happened in, in Paris, right, which, which the play mentioned, it, uh, and I agree it's complex. Um, but I also think that uh, doing conflict resolution or negotiating or doing peace work, all of that, it's not necessary, uh, actually not necessary, it's not appeasement, right? It's not stepping back and being always nice and gentle and soft and, and good uh, and all of that because uh, advocacy, I think, is an com important component in conflict resolution. Right? There are injustices that need to be addressed. There are, um, there are truths that need to be expressed collectively uh, in order to create the conditions for then creating creating a, a, a peaceful or, or a society where we can we can coexist. Right, but it depends on how we do it. It depends and on how we it do it. Doing it in a yeah. way that's respectful yeah. of the people in the situation and just challenging maybe some of the ideas. But if we separate that, but sometimes it's very difficult to do that because everything gets all caught up. Yeah. And things are much more complex. Just when you're telling the story about cooking pasta with the guy is that we realize that a lot of people who do things that we think are just horrendous are people. Yeah. And they're reacting to their lives in, in ways that we would think we would never do, but actually we don't know because we're not in those situations. We're not in those circumstances. And I think when I was younger, my first career was working with kids with learning disabilities and emotional disturbances. And I could work with any kind of special ed kind of kid. What I could never <coughs> do was work with senior citizens, because that was too close, because I was getting there. I knew I probably wouldn't have learning problems, because I didn't have them yet, but I, wa I was gonna get old, mm -hmm. and that was too close. You have to know where you work and where you're effective and what triggers certain kind of emotional reactions. But being respectful of the people is a, is a big challenge, because I think that when people have those kind of terrorist attacks, for them, and for some of the audiences they're playing to, so to speak, they're freedom fighters. So how do we define what that means from their perspective and understand if we took that act, if you need to justify your existence or be proud of yourself, there must be a healthier way to do that and not do it in the way that they did it. Yeah. In any case, I'm taking a diet, talking about food again, uh, taking a diet in terms, of, in, <laughs> in terms of news, because I, I, I go back to the point that I was making before, that we are left many times, the only thing that we are left with, like at the end of this play, is with hatred, right? And I, and I think that that is such, is such an obstacle in, in creating that space where understanding is possible, right? Where, where we can start a dialogue that if we have, then maybe, it doesn't turn us in one way or the other in, a, in extremists, right? And, uh, um, and, I, and I think that's where we uh, need to start over. I, I, it's probably not, not quoted by academics, but I, I saw an interview uh, with Elton John in, in the New York Times, and he ended by saying, it's a simple sentence, but I like, where it says, it's better to build bridge than, than walls, right? And, and I think there is a lot of cure to do too. We, we have a lot of poisoned uh, hearts uh, today around the world, and I think we need to, to cure our hearts if, and, and do the work from within if we want to create a space where we can coexist. Yeah, I'm just wondering why you call it hatred when I would think of it as being hurt. And maybe 
it leads towards a feeling or a thought that it might be hatred. But I saw both men as being just very hurt, and hurt because their, their identity was questioned, their, their sense of being in the world that they created for themselves was being questioned and criticized. So I felt them being hurt, and then they react to that. But I'm not, I wouldn't know if I would call it hatred. Yeah, I'm, I'm using hatred because I, lay, I, I read Albert Camus and, and, and he... You're very and he, influenced by what you're yes, reading. Yes, and always. And, that, and that's what I, to those dynamics, that's how he expresses this. But, but I think that, that that cutting the communication, right, because there is this inability to, uh, for empathy, I mean, yes. to, to understand the other's worlds, right, that, that, that it's pretty violent if you, if you, yes. you, if you want. So the risk is cutting the communication completely. Correct. Mm -hmm. the, on the good side, it could be a temporary cut as long as there was some reflection and learning from that experience that then they came back to each other in a new way because the relationship would have been important enough to do that. Yeah. But we don't know if the relationship is important enough or if it was a superficial relationship, as we mentioned. Or that it was not that, yeah, that big of a relationship. Yeah. So deciding how important the relationship is influences how much you're willing to put into engaging. Because it's difficult. It's very difficult. You know, as a conflict resolution practitioner, I can just tell other people these are the things you can do, but then when it's my conflict situation, I'm you know, a little huffy and puffy yeah. about things, say, okay, you should know better, Beth, about these things. And then I have to come in, but put that other place on, that other hat, yeah. to put that on, to really deal. Because it's a very painful process to deal with your own conflict situation. Yeah. And, and, and I think that looking for the connection with that is always important. If you, if you even ask any crisis negotiator uh, that deals with, with a hostage situation, mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that this negotiator needs to do is to create a connection Absolutely. with whoever is keeping people in, in, uh, in uh, hostage. Because unless there is this connection, you go nowhere, right? And, and I think maybe the, the, the art of life and the experiences and the failures and the times we are losers uh, also can teach us how, how we can become better in whatever situation we are, whatever. So how can we connect and discover that we share the same humanity independently yeah. from identity, idea, situation, or things that are good that we are doing. Yeah, and that's the empathy thing we yeah. mentioned before, really being able to empathize. One time I took a uh, crisis hostage negotiation workshop, and it was simulated, and it, I felt my pressure going up, and I usually don't have high pressure, but I felt my pressure going up because it was so difficult, and I was supposed to talk a person out of suicide. And what I, the feedback I got afterwards was almost everything I did was pushing her closer to <laughs> suicide. So I said, you know, I don't think I'm gonna go to this area. Because you don't, you don't know. Right. I felt it's just that unknown. What, and this Oops. is, in any kind of conversation you have, not quite suicidal, I hope, but any conversation, what is it? that's gonna trigger somebody, because you don't know what they experienced before in their life. One example I had is I was teaching conflict resolution one time, doing a very innocuous listening activity, and one of the really good students in the class got hysterical crying and left the room. And I was in the middle of doing something, so I couldn't go after her. And then afterwards, when the other instructor came up and I went out and I said, are you all right, what happened? And one of the things we had said in the room about listening is people just wanna be heard. And she said, last year, my brother committed suicide. And when you said that, I just thought, oh my God, why weren't we there to hear him? And then he ended up going to that extreme act. So you never know when you're gonna get a reaction. When people come to work in the morning, you don't know what they've been through. Did they just roll out of bed because they live around the corner? Or did they have to get the kids to school and get an hour and this and that and maybe have a three or four hour commute, whatever it is, by the time they wake up till the time they get to the workplace. So you don't know what that is. And then at the same time, you don't know what's gonna turn a person always to really then have empathy and be soft. Yeah, and I think you, you spoke about listening. I think uh, <coughs> this is really the most important quality, uh, also in negotiation and, and creating connection. It, it can turn things around, just the fact that you're just listening without, without any saying anything. And for me, that turned around a very difficult situation because I, I was in Colombia uh, dealing with a very difficult uh, ceasefire negotiation. And uh, I had the, the, the sympathy, if you want, of, of the bad guys, of, of a guerrilla, but I had, I had absolutely against me and, and trying to boycott my work, the government negotiator, 
uh, to the point where he was accusing me of being a member of the international front of his guerrilla group, uh, which has consequences like ending up in jail, right? Um, especially if it's the, the, the country negotiated, the, the government negotiated on who does it. So, and, uh, and I was trying to meet him, and uh, every time he would set up a meeting with me, he would cancel at the last minute. Uh, but he would continue uh, to, to, to say, to lie about, about who I am and who I was. So at one point, I had an appointment at the US Embassy uh, to do some, some, some briefing about the, the, the conflict. And I said, well, I, I want to take the opportunity. I want to talk to the ambassador and tell him I have his problem. Of, uh, and, and that it can be dangerous, uh, not only in jail, but it, it, uh, it can all, I, I was also getting death threats at the time, so it was not really easy. And, 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 and so when I was about to tell that to the ambassador, the ambassador would say, well, you know, I spoke to the minister, <coughs> I told him we are going to meet, um, and, and he said, oh, I would like to finally meet uh, uh, Mr. Aldo Chico. Also, great, uh, I take the opportunity. And, uh, and so he set up a meeting, right? Uh, I was pretty nervous because, uh, because I resented him. I probably also hated him for the things that he was telling me, but uh, I tried to remain focused on why we were meeting, and, and I, I said, I need to find a connection with, I need to be able to work with this guy, because otherwise uh, I'm not gonna be efficient facilitating with ceasefire negotiation. And so I remember we got in this room, uh, he had a PowerPoint presentation, I sat down, I did the screen thing that I just told you, uh, trying to imagine him in a more funny and pleasant way. And I listened to him for three hours. The guy didn't stop talking for three hours, and once in a while he was going under my skin and trying to have a powerful reaction, but I had my secret screen, and so I, I was able to listen. Three hours. Of three hours. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I walked out of that office with a hemicrane so strong that I had to cancel my flight and, and, and stay one night more there. But we changed the quality of our relationship. From that moment on, every time I went to Bogota, he wanted to see me and he opened up more and more. And, and we created a trust, uh, not as bodies and friends, but that working trust that allowed us in very critical moment then during the peace process to bring things uh, forward. It, it didn't end with the agreement of the ceasefire as we would have loved to. Uh, but the good news is that yesterday the, this group announced that they are uh, picking up against the, the, the talk, so mm. you can see that, that the work done is not lost. Right? But for me that was an important experience because okay. I, I had all, you know, if I would have just followed my emotions, I would have screamed at the guy, right? <laughs> or, or strangled him, or not have met him, right? Okay. But remaining focused on why I was there, what my role was, and just hearing him out until the last word for three hours, uh, getting my Amy crane, that was yeah. what turned things around in terms of the quality of the relationship. So it reminds me of two things when you're saying that, that uh, getting a migraine, the work is exhausting. The work takes so much energy because you have to be conscious on so many different levels at the same time. You're conscious of what's being said, you're conscious of your emotions, you're conscious of the other person's emotions, the context, everything, and so it's so exhausting and you're in the moment and you're working really hard to balance everything. When you go home, it's like exhaustion. Yeah. And the other piece that came up when you were talking was also like ethical responsibility and doing this kind of work, like who are we gonna speak with, who are we not gonna speak with? Are we showing that we're taking sides by doing that or not? Doing any kind of facilitation, any kind of workshops, working with people in peace talks and so on, you have an ethical responsibility to take care of people as well. And so if there's anything happening, Whatever does happen at the end of that session, you have to make sure people are okay to go on and not to push people beyond where they're able to do it. And it's a very fine line sometimes mm -hmm. too in that. So once I was doing a workshop and somebody um, got some feedback from somebody else and then she goes, now I know why my husband has been saying I'm a bitch for the past 10 years. And she was really said it very loud, I'm being mild. And I was like, oh no, now what do I do with this? You know, and it was like four o'clock at the end of a five o'clock workshop and I had to make sure she was okay before she went home and wasn't totally distraught there. So it's the whole ethical responsibility. And again, not knowing you're gonna get the reaction you're gonna yeah. get. Was there any parts of the play that you found particularly hot as negotiators? I think um, one thing we talked about was the relationship when they were talking about their fathers. That was a really hot button, you know, and uh, each 
had his own relationship with his father and one that was willing to be shared or not because there was still some unresolved issues there. I think for Jamie there was some unresolved issues with his dad. And um, Marcus may, but he was still very connected to his father. Maybe having a complex relationship where he appreciated but resented at the same time, maybe because of the financial support. But uh, Jamie had a lot of unresolved issues, I feel, and then when they went there, it was a little bit of a hot button in that place there. I think also in, in uh, <clears throat> well, what, there is a point of a dynamic which I found very, very interesting because uh, we, we might just do it unconsciously a lot of times and, and we don't realize how, how we shut down a communication by doing it and, and we feel so good about ourselves, which is when we go on a higher moral ground, right? And, and then we say, uh, uh, I, I, I get it, right? Or, uh, uh, and, and, and I think in the replay that, that's, that's pointed out very, in a very precise uh, way and made me reflect how many times you know, it's, it's a way to get out by being, remaining clean, right? I, I don't get dirty, I, I, I admit. Uh, but it's true that, that you cut off the, the communication. I, I, I found that it was a very uh, nuanced, nuanced uh, Did passage. you feel that they both did? Yeah. She told me about that. When he says accept, get him on that. Because he controls our conversations all the time. Right, yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> Uh, and again, you know, you can use that technique uh, because every when you when you learn to to resolve conflict, you learn also to uh, to, to nourish a conflict, right? Depends on your objective, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a great technique that you might have if you are not <laughs> interested in in continuing a conversation, right? But instead, if you are someone who cares about connecting and actually getting to the to the substance of of, of a dispute. Uh, Putting yourself on a higher moral stand, it's 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 exactly what you should not do, right? So I, I, I thought that that comes out. Right? Yeah, Very I was going to say also the non-verbal part. <clears throat> so getting up and just I'm going to the bathroom. Right. Mm -hmm. So then Marcus is telling a story, and Jamie comes back and totally interrupts the story, and it's just moving the table. So it's t and it reminded me recently of the funeral of the police officer when the police officers turn their backs mm -hmm. to the mayor. It was a very powerful act, you know, and um, all that nonverbal stuff, and it's about respect and disregard for the other person as a person. And that is a very, it's very subtle sometimes, you know. When I lived in Japan, there was, um, at that time, it was in the 90s, and the bubble had burst, and the economy was changing, and lifelong employment was starting to change. So a lot of men who had worked forever in the same company were now being asked to retire, so they're like, 60, maybe 65 years old, and they don't have any hobbies, maybe golf, because they've never done anything else. And there was always that dynamic in the house where the wife ate after the man, and the wife took her bath after the man, and she read the newspaper after the man. So you can tell how well I did there, coming from New York. And then um, there was one very subtle interaction, and the man's sitting there in the kitchen, unemployed now, you know, and he says to the woman, oh, get me the whatever, and she just looks at him very, it's in the refrigerator. <gasps> oh my God, what she, what she said was not just like, get it yourself, it's in the refrigerator, you can do that, but just that little shift and that turn, the whole power dynamics where it was always like this in the house and then boom, like that. But it totally criticized who he was as a man, as her husband and everything else. So very subtle acts change the whole dynamic. So what kind of dialogue is the best kind of dialogue to have in your opinion? Like, You've said like, you know, you shouldn't, you're like a loser is a person who stays like inside of the emotion. A loser is a person who walks away. Like, and when you go like towards like, I'd A, like to know like what your like the best type of dialogue you think is. And then secondly, like in a way, like how does that relate to theatricality? So like in a sense, like when someone's emotional, we consider that to be something that's honest, you know? So like to what degree does like truth play in via emotions? And then to what degree does like your job sort of like fall into lines of theatricality? Like when I'm watching these guys, I feel like kind of between two states of like, when do I trust that you're speaking? When do I trust that you're repeating? Like, you know, like what kind of things do we do just to like make a situation like a muted between and when does something become something where it's like, this is my personal stance, mm -hmm. you know? When do we trust, I guess? It's hard for me to answer what's the best because it's situational also. Mm -hmm. And I would say that whatever you do, and I'm not saying you shouldn't be in the emotion, but you should understand what the emotion is because emotions are information mm -hmm. and it's telling you something and then what do you do with that at the time? 
So what I think is a good practice is to understand what you're in when you're in it. Mm -hmm. And to know that if I take this action, this is the consequence of that action. Is that what I want? If yes, then you go ahead and take it and accept responsibility for the outcome. If that's not what I want, then maybe I take a different action because that leads to something else. And if that's what I want, then that's the way I go. Whichever way we go to take responsibility and not to say, well, you made me do this or it's your fault, I'm like this. Not the blame, but to take responsibility for what it is. But that takes work. And I tease students too and they say, oh, but I did self-awareness last semester. Yeah. <laughs> I say, oh, really? Well, how about this is life work? You know? You're constantly doing it. I say, I've been doing it for like a long time. I'm not saying that I'm an example of it, but you know, you don't do it. I, I do think that emotions are important, so and also to play them out, and, and because, as, as you say, that's being sincere and honest, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you are in those dynamics uh, uh, and and you try to come from a, a negotiation or conflict resolution perspective. Uh, you try not to bring those emotions to a point where they become destructive, uh, as we saw in the play, mm -hmm. right? So all those play uh, bursts of emotions and all the things that we were, were telling themselves were also all great opportunities, if they would have wanted or were trained, or to, to actually get an insight of how the other mm -hmm. sees the world, right? Those were all opportunities, but missed opportunities, so that the conflict is clear to the point where we were left with, with, with a broken communication at least until tomorrow, right? So, th th that, so when you are in those situations and you realize that the, uh, playing out the emotion becomes a destructive pattern, if you are trained and, and, and therefore when you're trained it means that you did a lot of mistakes and, 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 and you probably repeat them again, but if, if you are in a moment where you're conscious, you try to uh, uh, break those patterns of emotion, right? And, and there can be different kinds of techniques that you can do. It depends on the situation, the person, and the, and the trust that you have in the relationship. But you try to do something. You move physically, or, or it can, also just walking away for a moment can be help, ju just to bring the situation down, right? Um, the theatricality is important in, in our work. Right? Remember, I, 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 uh, I was uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation where we had a very the parties had a, um, it was the parties within the same group, it was not. Uh, but the discussion was very uh, heated and at some point one of the guys just lost it and, and, and went ballistic, right? And so I, I took him and said, you lose it only if there is a reason to lose it, right? In the sense that if there is a tactic to that losing, therefore the theatricality, because you need mm -hmm. to get to a point, then do it, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's just because you're losing it, mm -hmm. you're going to lose the negotiation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think, but that comes with with the experience, which means with the with the with, with, with mistakes and, and, and failures, right? But but um, again, that's why also I say before, conflict resolution negotiation doesn't mean to be nice and you know respectful always, and that that's that's a little bit fake, I think. You you you. Because then, then you are a persona. Uh, mm -hmm. so instead, you need to create a space where the real stuff can come out, right? And it can be raw, there can be mm -hmm. tears, and it can be very difficult, but it can be cathartic mm -hmm. if, if there is someone in the room, uh, or, some, or if the situation doesn't need a mediator where one of the two is able to. I think you are always a loser negotiation if, you, if winning in a, in a sort of a zero sum, you are in a sort of a zero sum. Uh, framework, right? If winning is your winning you at all cost is your, your objective, then, then you probably lose in that in that negotiation, right? I, I think it's very interesting, and you can think uh, for yourself uh, when you are in a, whatever negotiation you are. Do you see in general the other as a competitor, as an opponent, or do you see as someone with whom you are collaborating to to build something that is even bigger and better, right? Mm -hmm. And and. And that state of mind, how you enter in a conversation and a negotiation, I think that that makes a huge difference on how that pattern and that conversation, that dynamic goes, right? If, if you are a competitor, uh, like in the play, that was also a dynamic of competition constantly, right? Mm -hmm. um, then it's, it becomes more, becomes more difficult. If you start seeing as an opportunity to build something mm -hmm. different and that something new can come out, which is good for both for a situation, not as something 
negotiating it down for you that you will get only a part of the pie instead of the entire pie, mm -hmm. but you see, well, I'm getting a better pie, um, then, then I think that, that attitude uh, helps, right? But if you want to just the entire pie, you're going to lose. Yeah. So the problem. authenticity mm -hmm. is important because sometimes you have to shake things up a little bit because mm -hmm. you don't want the status quo, but you have to be intentional about what you're doing in mm -hmm. doing that. Yes. I just wanted to make a comment about your coping mechanism of seeing this. Oh, yeah. Because it validates my technique. And when I'm in a room with a difficult person, which happens to be one in the family, so I have to see this person a lot, I imagine this person naked with a frog on her head. And that does with it. The and that does it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, that's great. Well, thank you. <laughs> I want to yeah, use that I with my that. Yeah. person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever helps us. I think that the skills and, and the techniques help us to be in a state of mind that are productive for us and for the situation, right? Because then, then we are not victims. I think that's, that's when we fall into a victim, and, and I think that's the other thing, the other bottom, if you think that, I, that the, the play points out. When you're enter into a victim state of mind and you start acting as a victim, hey, you're a loser, right? Because, because you are actually giving power to the situation, to the other, to them, and you're not claiming, you're not taking responsibility mm -hmm. for what is happening in that dynamic, right? Uh, and and it, yeah, I think that is the shift. That then, then you are able, you are free from that emotion dynamic to make the choices. Mm -hmm. And the choice might be, well, you know what? I need to walk out of this relationship. I need to make a step and move on. Doesn't mean necessarily always re full reconciliation if the situation doesn't allow it. But you are empowered to make a choice and a decision which puts your destiny forward, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if I can ask another one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just last, last, last one. Is that okay? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, just semantics wise, you mentioned like building a higher ground. So like, you know, you're like, if we talk about winners and losers, like we tend to think of like, I'm a predator and like, I, we all like want to get on higher ground, mm -hmm. you know, versus lower ground. Mm -hmm. Like I've always thought of mediation as like a middle point yep. as though we're just like on this like big horizontal plane. Yeah. But like, is part of it a motivation then for both parties? So it like includes both parties by like transcending almost that you would, in some way like rise is that you know like is that are there almost i guess what i'm asking are there almost like metaphorical or like physical like states that you align with the sense of progress when you're actually talking to people in a mediation situation yeah 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 so you know just getting people to even talk to each other mm -hmm. is already an accomplishment for a lot right because and one of the things we're taught to do as mediators you know and we continue to teach is to thank people for their participation because it's an enormous amount of effort to be there and to really open up and be vulnerable. Just think about the amount of trust it takes to do that. And in order to have a successful mediation, you have to get to that level of trust and vulnerability. Now, of course, there are different kinds of, what are you mediating? You know, you're mediating something about, well, you owe me $100. That's a little bit of a different kind of mediation than something that's a longer term relationship type mediation. But I think that um, some people will always feel like this, but that doesn't mean they can't mediate. Or some people may aspire to this and they can mediate. It depends on what the goal is of the mediation and whether people trust the process. So for me, one of the most important things is trusting the process. I don't, don't always know exactly where it's gonna go or how it's gonna go, but I trust that we can go somewhere that's constructive or not, but I trust the process of the mediation. About that. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I agree completely. And that, that's really the art of mediation, is to get two people, you know, in general, when I, when I, when I see that with, with clients or, or when I go around the world and, and, and do, there is so much fear in the person, you know, e even though it comes out across in a very arrogant way, secure way, what we are, we are so f fearful of losing them something about themselves that for them is, that you need to create a space where they feel confident that they can actually enter in that dialogue, right? And, and it would take now a long time, but one of, one of the things that I try to do when I'm in that one-of-one -one conversation that might help to create that space is to reframe how they see the other or the enemy, right? And you do it in a very subtle way by using 
the words and the semantics and the examples that they themselves they are, they are using, but you basically help them to humanize the other or to see that, oh, maybe there is another interpretation that is possible about that reaction or that, that posture, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, small example, I, I just did that with a client the other day and, and, uh, and uh, he's a young actor and, and he was so pissed with his father because his father was pissed at him and because he was yelling at him and the story was that basically at the breakfast they forgot to make coffee for this kid, right, who, who was visiting. And, 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 and so the father went ballistic, but he went ballistic not against the, my client, but against himself because he had forgotten to make coffee with his son, for his son, right? So he was so, but, but he unloaded it to, to his son. And so I was listening to his story, and then at one point with a few words, I just gave him a cue that what was happening was something different else. And that completely shifted him emotionally Right and reconnected it emotionally with his father again instead of, right. So you you, you use those techniques if you want strategy, but but I, where there's also a lot of common sense if you want, where, where you help people to see that it's nothing is pervasive and permanent, but there might be other possibilities. And once you are able to do that, then there is the opening where, you know, you calm down and then th that meeting is, is is possible. But you need to prepare them if they're not. Yeah. Prepared to. And then it depends on how embedded they are in the conflict. So if it's a conflict that you've grown up with and it really connects with your identity and for you that person's the enemy for whatever reasons, mm -hmm. when that person starts to shift and change, you also don't like this. Every time there are any kind of peace talks and when peace talks are getting closer towards peace, you see there's an increase in violence because people are feeling threatened because if I grew up in a refugee camp my whole life, that was the enemy. And if you're telling me that's not the enemy, now that's my friend, I can't deal with that because now I have to change everything about who I am because I was always in relation to that person as the enemy and now I'm not anymore. So that's a really much bigger yeah. upheaval. And it's also a technique that sometimes they use because negotiators need to have the support of a base, right? And, and, and uh, one of the <coughs> things that is very dangerous is that if the negotiators don't reflect and mirror their base, right? So exactly what is happening, what, what Beth is describing, is many times used as a technique to assure the, uh, the, the base, we are not wimps, right? We are still very much, and we can do, it, do this, right? In that, in that, uh, in that setting. Yeah. Uh, and, and food, sorry, let me finish. It's, very, it's always very important. <laughs> in sorry, all no, it's true. You know, sure. true, it's true. If you look at where is one of the reasons why probably I like to do this work, all these peace processes <laughs> happen in nice resorts with great food, right? And it's not, <laughs> and it's not, and it's not by chance, right? Because because food connects, right? Uh, uh, one of my mentor inspirations is Senator George Mitchell, who negotiated the, the uh, Green Friday agreements, right? And he told me that. He put the people in a small apartment and had them live together and cook for, for a couple of days until the official part, but just that they uh, can connect themselves. So take them out from the function, the role, the perception they have themselves, of their duty, their responsibility, and meet them, have them meet as, as, as human. That's another thing that you can think of, how can I you know, help in uh, I in changing that I situation. see a book in this about cooking and negotiation. <laughs> I always call it pasta with pasta. Yeah. <laughs> 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 On that peacefully gastronomic note, <laughs> 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 thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.